This is Ronin, our protagonist, and just like Ryu, he is also single virgin loser, but also a pervert. And on top of that, he is also an orphan. And if that was not enough, his sister and all his friends died at the hands of these bald monsters in front of his eyes, and now he is also about to die. Despite this before his death, he kissed his half-dead commander. Then he regressed back in time to ask a lady, do you have a dick? Well, no one knows how, where, or why these bald beings invaded Earth, but after a harsh ten years of battle, two bald beings died. However, in the process, all the hunters and warriors of Earth were killed, and Ronan himself was about to die after killing the last one. Just then, he heard a sound, and hurriedly went toward the sound to find his thick Oh, sorry. I mean his commander. At first, a smile broke across his face that he might be able to repopulate Earth again. So today's like goal is 1,500 likes. Please like and subscribe to support the channel. Now let's continue. But the happiness soon turned to shock when he noticed her grievous injuries. She had lost one of her arms and blood was pouring from the wound. The general's face was serious and pale, her body barely hanging on to life. She seemed to be sitting, taking support from the boulder, her eyes filled with a mix of pain and determination. The general's name was Addison. Ronan asked her if she was okay, to which she replied that she was breathing, at least for now. But then, with a serious tone, she asked, Is that damn god dead? Ronan confirmed that he had just killed the last of the so-called gods disguised as monsters, and that its corpse was not far from here. Hearing this, Adeshin let out a sigh of relief, tears starting to flow from her eyes. Still crying, she thanked Ronan for killing the god. After an awkward silence, Ronan, smiling, asked the general that if she was truly grateful, he had a request for her, to give a proper funeral to all of his friends and comrades. The general replied that he could do it himself since he was in better shape than she was. But before Ronan could say anything, he started coughing, and his blood-covered hand showed the general that his time was near. With a trembling smile on his face, he acknowledged that he would die any time now. The general agreed to his request, and then asked another question that if he survived, was there anything he would like to do? Ronan replied that there were too many things he wanted to do to even count. But then, with a sorrowful face, he looked up at the sky, saying the one thing he thought of every day was seeing his dead sister one last time. Those damned demons who called themselves gods had killed her, and he hadn't been able to protect her. The taunt from the demon suggesting that if Ronan had trained harder, he would have saved them, was eating him from inside. But then, suddenly, the raindrops froze in midair, shocking both Ronan and Adishan. The whole earth started to shake, jolting them even more. When they looked up at the sky, their whole world turned upside down. Before them stood a white deity with multiple wings, a divine aura, red eyes, and dozens of other white deities beside him. Seeing them, Ronan couldn't believe what he was witnessing, while Adishan was frozen in terror, thinking, weren't there only supposed to be three of them? With a defeated face, she whispered, so I won't be able to save Earth even the third time. As she was lost in shock, Ronan shouted her name several times until she finally regained consciousness. With a serious face, he told her that they needed to get it together, and she should hurry up and ready herself for a fight. Still confused, as she had given up, Adishan couldn't believe that Ronan hadn't. She asked him if he was really going to fight, to which Ronan replied, It's better to fight rather than just sit there. Then, with a stern face, he continued holding his sword, saying, Today, even if he dies, he should at least destroy some of those damn pieces of filth. And he swung his sword with great force. Seeing this, Adishan remained in shock, unable to comprehend the situation or Ronan's determination. Adishan looked at Ronan, reflecting on how he hadn't given up even in this dire situation. Then she realized that Ronan had always been like this. That's why he had made it this far. As he stood before the deities, Adishan, observing his back, commented to herself, If it's this man, he really could do it. Then, suddenly, she reached out, grabbed Ronan's shoulder, and kissed him, startling him. The deities watched from above, seemingly enjoying the show. But it wasn't a mere kiss. Adishan was transferring a blue glowing marble from her mouth to Ronan's. Confused, Ronan asked what she had put in his mouth. Adishan leaned close and whispered something in his ear. Whatever she was saying shocked Ronan. Ronan questioned Adishan, his voice full of confusion asking Adishan, What nonsense is she saying at this serious moment? With a polite voice and a sweet smile, Adishan replied, If we ever meet again, can you tell me not to do something useless like being a commander? 
Ronan was still bewildered by what she was saying. Above them, the deities prepared their attack and launched it towards them, annihilating them along with the entire Earth. Then, the story circled back to where it began, with the blue marble burning, and Ronan opened his eyes in shock. He found himself looking at a vibrant blue sky and beautiful green fields, a sight that was nothing like the red sky and bloody rain he was used to. Still bewildered, Ronan checked his surroundings, noticing fields and children playing, and realized that he was in his hometown of Nimberton. What the hell is happening? He questioned, now sitting under a tree, holding his head and pondering the situation. He recalled the moment when General Adishan kissed him and transferred that blue marble to him. She had whispered in his ear about the secret of how she became so powerful, how she became one of the strongest human. The marble had the ability to return the owner back in time, but the catch was it could only be used four times, and she had already used it three times. She was giving the last chance to Ronan because she believed he was the only one who could stop the deities if he were trained properly. And then she had recommended Ronan go to Filion Academy, where he would be able to hone his abilities to the top. Adishan continued, smiling happily, said to... Tell her to become a good tailor instead, as she have done all sorts of jobs, but not that. That was their last conversation before they both died with the entire earth. Now Ronan was slamming his head on the tree he was sitting under, asking himself if this was all real or just a dream, and if it was a dream, he needed to snap out of it. The people around him were watching him in confusion. Then suddenly he stopped, realizing something. If I really came back to the past... He said to himself, a glimmer of hope in his eyes. He grabbed a stick and started running, exclaiming that he would be able to see his sister again. He didn't care even if it was a dream. He just wanted to see his sister one last time. Running fast through the streets, he finally accepted that he had indeed traveled back to the past, and his heart swelled with happiness. But then he stopped, noticing something just beside the field. Some people were bullying a kid, and upon observing them carefully, he realized that the child was somehow hung upside down. It wasn't by any rope, but by magic. Ronan thought it was not possible for the bullies to possess such high-level magic, as it was even rare on the battlefield, let alone in a small village like his. Suddenly, Ronan's attention was drawn to a young kid with red hair. He seemed frightened and was panicking. The source of the powerful magic was this kid. She was Asil, a villager who lives near his house. Ronan could see the magical aura around her wavering, like she was struggling to control it. He realized she was the one keeping the bullied kid floating in the air, and it looked like she couldn't hold him up much longer. Meanwhile, the bullied kid was pleading for mercy, begging the bullies to stop. He was explaining that he didn't have any money left. His remaining cash was needed to buy medicine for his sick mother. If he gave them his money, his mother might die. Hearing this, the boss of the bully group smirked and mocked. Am I supposed to care about your mom's health too when taking money from you? He then started slapping the bullied kid, saying, If he wants to be such a caring son, he should just earn more money. He laughed along with his group members who were watching the whole scene with amusement. The boss of the bully group was growing impatient with Asil. He turned to her and ordered her to lift the bullied kid even higher in the tree. The girl's voice trembled as she replied that she didn't have the energy to do so, and she feared that she might accidentally drop him. Her plea fell on deaf ears as the boss grew furious demanding her to lift the child higher, even saying that it would be better if the child fell. Asil truly nervous now, overwhelmed by the situation. She began to regret ever learning magic, thinking that if she hadn't, things might be different. Tears welled in her eyes as she strained to lift the kid higher. She bit her lips as she felt like she was about to collapse. Just before she could fall, someone struck her back with a wooden stick. It was Ronan who had intervened, telling them that they had gone far enough and that the child might die if they continued. When the red-haired kid lost control of his magic due to Ronan's intervention, the hanging child fell to the ground. The boss of the bully group shouted in anger, demanding to know what was going on. But Ronan didn't pay attention to the boss's anger. He stepped forward to protect the red-haired kid, whom we learn is actually a boy named Asil, not a girl. Ronan lived not far from Asil's house, so Asil recognized him right away. Although he was nervous, he introduced himself, and Ronan replied with a serious tone that he had some important work to do with him from now on, and he should ignore that piece of shit and stop getting nervous. The boss continued to shout angrily, feeling ignored, but Ronan simply continued his conversation with Asil, asking him where he had learned his magic. Asil replied, still nervously, that he had just learned it from a magic book he had bought from a vendor. Hearing Asil's explanation, 
Ronan fell into deep thought. He couldn't believe that Asel could learn magic from some low-quality magic book on his own. And if Asel was indeed this talented, why hadn't he seen or heard about him in the past, or rather, in his future life? All the while, the bully's boss was still shouting something in the background, but Ronan ignored him as he pondered on Asel's talent. This was pretty amazing, Ronan concluded. He decided he would check out Asel body in more detail later that night. But for now, he had another problem to deal with. The piece of shit had drawn his sword, clearly furious with Ronan for ignoring him. He adopted a fighting stance and then, with a roar, charged full force at Ronan. As the sword descended toward him, Ronan immediately recognized it as a real long sword. He wondered where this bully had acquired such a weapon. He took in the boss's fighting form, noting that it was clumsy and untrained. Still, the boss seemed physically strong, and his attack could pose a threat to others but not to Ronan. With an agile movement, Ronan dodged the boss's attack. The sword swooshed past him, hitting only air. Now, more furious than ever, the piece of shit couldn't believe how Ronan, who he used to bully easily, had dodged his attack. Ronan, on the other hand, knew that even though his body was currently very weak, he had a secret weapon, his battle sense. The experience of countless battles fought in his past life was ingrained in him. The piece of shit laughed and mocked Ronan, saying he was lucky to have dodged the attack. He even threatened to make Ronan incapable of lifting a spoon. Ronan replied sarcastically, expressing how lucky he indeed felt that day. The piece of shit readied himself for another attack, saying that if Ronan begged for mercy by holding his foot, he might forgive him after cutting off one of his arms. Ronan, appearing bored, simply whimpered, Oh my, how scary! The piece of shit continued, lowering his tone to something even more sinister. He said that if Ronan died today, he didn't need to worry about his older sister, as he would take good care of her every night. He even commented on her appearance, saying he thought about her every night. Before he could finish his sentence, Ronan's voice deepened, his eyes glowing red with fury. Did you just say my older sister? He asked, his voice dripping with menace. Yes, that jiggly boobs would be nice to grab. But before he could finish his sentence, Ronan swung the wooden stick in his hand with full force, cutting off the piece of shit's left ear. The piece of shit's ear went flying through the air, and he dropped his sword, clutching his wounded head, screaming and crying in pain. His face turned pale and purple, his body writhing in agony. His underlings watched in terror, frozen and unsure of what to do. With a deep voice filled with rage, Ronan glared at him, his face like that of a wild beast ready to devour its prey. You little son of a bully, he growled. Do you want to die? Still in disbelief, one of the underlings panicked, asking, How is it possible that the piece of shit had an actual sword, but Ronan cut his ear with just a mere wooden stick? It doesn't make any sense. Ronan's anger didn't subside. He glared at the underlings, demanding to know why they were just watching. Kicking the piece of shit in the head, he continued, If they don't want to end up like this piece of filth, they should take him with them and get lost. And of course they have to leave the money they stole from the kid, plus some extra as compensation because they spoiled his mood. Ronan tossed the bag full of money to the bullied kid, saying it was his. The kid's eyes widened, and he stared at the bag in disbelief. Panicking, he asked Ronan if he was really giving all this money to him, as it was more than the amount the piece of shit had taken from him. Ronan reassured the kid, saying, It's fine since he's already satisfied with the long sword he took from them, and he doesn't have to worry about that piece of shit. From today on, they won't be able to raise their heads up again. Joyful tears sprang to the kid's eyes, and he thanked Ronan from the bottom of his heart. Ronan dismissed it as nothing and urged the kid to hurry home. But from behind them, a shaky voice directed their attention to Acel. He was blushing from shyness and with a trembling voice apologized to the kid. No matter how much that piece of filth threatened him, he knew he shouldn't have done that. He started crying, saying, He was too scared to say something, so he just followed their commands, and he truly is sorry and ashamed of himself. He continued to beg for forgiveness, his body racked with sobs. Ronan and the bullied kid watched him, and after a moment, the kid smiled, playfully calling Asel a crybaby. He put his hand on Asel's shoulder, reassuring him that it wasn't his fault and that he forgave him. With a bright smile on his face, he bid them farewell and left, leaving Ronan and Asel alone. Ronan studied Asel's body thoughtfully. He concluded that Asel was sexy, not a bad guy, just an easygoing kid. Then, with his knee, he bumped Asel's shoulder, startling him. Ronan reminded Asel again, as he was leaving, to remember what he had said earlier, that he had important business to discuss. Asel's confusion was evident. He called after Ronan, asking what he meant, and Ronan explained that he had some important business to attend to, and he would meet Asel in three days at the entrance of the jungle when the moon rises. 
just to make it romantic. He winked and added, and as for what will happen if he don't come, well, he already know. Hearing this, Aesil's mind conjured up a frightening image of Ronan taking out his sword, and he felt a chill run down his spine. He nodded quickly, agreeing to the meeting, but once Ronan had left, he found himself wondering what had just happened. Why did Ronan want to meet him at night in the jungle? What was the important business he was talking about? And what was that comment about making it romantic? Then the scene shifted and we saw Ronan standing beside his house, holding a bouquet of roses, his face flushed with nervousness and shyness. Embarrassed, he turned around and started moving away from the house, muttering to himself that he knew it was too embarrassing. Then, in a warm and polite tone, someone called out to Ronan, saying that she wondered who it was outside the house. It turned out to be his older sister. Ronan was speechless after hearing her voice. He turned around and flashbacks of the past flooded his mind. His sister had been the only thing that had pushed him so far. Every day he thought about what he would say to her when they met in heaven. He would apologize for leaving the house without telling her. And now that she was in front of him, alive, words wouldn't come out of his mouth. His sister welcomed Ronan home with a bright smile, her eyes filled with joy and warmth. Ronan's emotions overcame him, and with tears in his eyes he said, I'm finally home, Nuna. It was a moment of pure emotion, a reunion that he never thought possible. Then we see Ronan and his Nuna sitting at the dining table, enjoying a meal together. Nuna is clutching the bouquet of roses excitedly, exclaiming how happy she is that for the first time, Ronan has bought something for her. This embarrasses Ronan even more, and he tries to hide his flushed face. After some time, Nuna starts asking if he's full and heaps a mountain of caring questions on him. Ronan somehow manages to calm the situation, diverting the conversation into more comfortable territory. Then, Ronan asks a question, how old is Nuna this year? She replies that she is 22 but looks puzzled, asking why he would ask such a thing out of nowhere. Ronan's response that he just can't remember worries her, and she throws another barrage of questions at him. But Ronan is lost in thought, realizing that if his sister is 22, then those damned gods will arrive on Earth in 10 years. Worriedly, Nuna places one hand on her forehead and the other on Ronan's, checking his temperature, thinking he's ill as he is behaving weirdly. However, Ronan wishes he could live in this peaceful moment forever. He knows that to protect this moment, he must be prepared for what's coming in ten years. He holds his Nuna's hand and with a smile on his face, says he has something important to tell her. This confuses Nuna and she looks at him with wide, questioning eyes. Ronan continues, his voice firm and determined, I want to marry, I mean, I want to enter the academy. Upon hearing Ronan's words, Nuna was first speechless. Then, her eyes sparkled with excitement as she started to shake Ronan's hand rapidly, urging him to say it again. Ronan, confused, was not expecting this response. With a joyful squeal, Nuna ran toward the cupboard and started searching for something. She pulled out a large gallon, and Ronan's confusion grew. When he checked what was inside, he was bewildered to find it full of gold coins. His Nuna said she was secretly saving this money for his future, and now that he want to enter an academy, she want to send him right away. Ronan first thanked her, saying he was really very grateful, but he insisted she should use the money for herself. He explained that the admission fee was very high, but he had already managed to take care of it. Hearing this, Nuna was startled, realizing that with such a large amount, he could go to any academy he wanted. But before she could finish her sentence, Ronan said, It's Imperial Filion Academy. Hearing this name, Nuna was first silent. Then her eyes widened and she shouted, What? Imperial Filion Academy was the elite institute considered number one in the entire empire. Its teachers were talented individuals gathered from all over the empire, and thus, the monthly fee was extremely high. But the cost was not the only obstacle. The admission selection rate was less than 0.1% as the entrance exam was notoriously difficult. In the future, heroes like Adishan, the Sword King, and others who fought against the deities till the end were all alumni of this academy. Ronan had expected his Nuna to be worried, but instead she cheered him on, telling him that if it was Ronan, he would undoubtedly pass the exam. He felt a renewed sense of determination. He had to pass the exam and return to the village to protect his Nuna. After waiting for some time, Aesil finally arrived and Ronan commented, I thought you wouldn't come, Marcel. Aesil corrected nervously, saying, It's Aesil, not Marcel. She continued, mentioning that Ronan was the one who said it wouldn't be good for him if he didn't come. However, Ronan replied with a wave of his hand, suggesting they ignore the small details as tonight they will both be busy, as he has something to test on Aesil. Ronan dropped his bag and stretched out, 
looking very sure of himself. Asel, blushing and surprised, wanted to ask what Ronan was up to, but before he could, Ronan interrupted, pointing at himself and telling Asel to use his psychic powers on him. He insisted on the maximum power, his face both confident and serious. Asel looked even more confused and began to panic a little. He questioned if Ronan really wanted him to use his power on him, explaining that it might be too dangerous and that Ronan might get hurt. Ronan, however, shook his head and reassured him, claiming that it was like child's play to him and that he wouldn't die. So Asel had no reason to be scared. Still feeling a bit scared, Asel activated his psychic ability and used it on Ronan. In a moment, Ronan was floating in midair, his body suspended by Asel's psychic power. Ronan's eyes widened in awe. Asel's abilities were more extraordinary than he had ever imagined. He was reminded of past battles where psychic magic users had enabled him to fight the deities on equal footing. Their unique ability to make him fly was essential, as the deities mostly attacked from the sky. He marveled at how Asel's control over his psychic powers was almost on par with the professionals. Ronan then smiled, lost in thought. Psychic powers were incredibly rare and finding a talented psychic like Ossel so easily felt like a blessing. He couldn't help but wonder why he hadn't met Ossel in his past life if he was this gifted. No matter what the reason, he knew that Ossel would be a vital asset in the upcoming battle against those bustards. Now, Ossel was struggling, panting as he said, I can't hold it any longer. Can I put you down? Ronan replied with a confident smile, telling Ossel that he didn't have to worry. Holding his sword, he continued, saying he would come down by himself, confusing Asel. With great force, Ronan swung his sword in midair, and Asel felt as if his psychic power that he had used on Ronan had been nullified. He was shocked, and Ronan safely landed on the ground from that great height. Asel, still bewildered, asked, What was that? And how did Ronan nullify his attack? Ronan didn't tell him, simply saying it was a secret. When Asel insisted, Ronan playfully punched his head, telling him that he would explain later, as they had more important things to do. A small bump could be seen on Asel's head behind Ronan, and from inside, Ronan himself didn't know how he had done it. He was just able to nullify any magic. He then glared at his sword, deep in thought, wondering if it might be the reason why his attacks worked on those deities. Asel continued to fire a barrage of questions from behind, his mind a whirlwind of confusion. But Ronan seemed to ignore them, focused on the task at hand. Placing his sword back in its sheath, he pondered the mystery of his ability but quickly shook it off. There would be time to think about it later. Turning to Asel, he announced that he had passed Ronan's test. He then picked up his bag and tossed it toward Asel, telling him to carry it and follow. Asel's confusion deepened, not only about how Ronan had nullified his attack, but also about what exactly was happening now. Ronan, however, was undeterred by his friend's bewilderment. With a broad smile and a dramatic, cool pose, he declared, This is the beginning of the great Ronan saga who will save the world. In a moment of vulnerability, Asel struck a cute pose, curling his fingers and gazing at Ronan. He spoke timidly, confessing that though Ronan was talented and strong, he himself knew nothing and was cowardly and timid. His voice wavered, revealing his inner fear and insecurity. Ronan's demeanor changed. His face became serious, and his voice took on a tone of stern resolve. He looked at Asel, his eyes piercing, and asked him if he wanted to continue living his life like this. Cowed and timid, Asel listened, his body tense and his eyes wide, as Ronan continued to challenge him. Was he going to waste his talent just to appease some punk? Was this how he wanted to live his life? Casually, Ronan then added that Asel was not only stupid, but also a crybaby who teared up at the slightest thing always a frightened, scaredy cat. The words seemed to pierce Asel's heart, a painful reminder of his own perceived shortcomings. But then Ronan's tone shifted, becoming more compassionate and earnest. He told Asel that those things didn't matter because they were things that could change from now on. What Asel could never change was the time that he had let flow by, the opportunities he had missed, the life he had neglected to live. Suddenly a wind blew, startling both of them and their hair fluttered in the breeze. Ronan continued, his voice now soft but filled with conviction. Someday, he said, you'll definitely come to regret it, and thought just like he had regretted it in his previous life. Ronan placed a reassuring hand on Asel's shoulder, his eyes softening. He asked if his speech had motivated Asel or made any impact. Asel's eyes welled with emotion, and a blush spread across his face. He held a hand to his mouth, touched by Ronan's care and concern. It was clear that Ronan's words had reached him, inspiring him to believe in himself and his potential. Hmm. I am telling you there is something wrong with Asel. With a determined look, Ronan began to move, telling Asel that he wouldn't force him to change. 
It was Asel's life, after all. But Asel, energized and excited, nervously followed Ronan. He insisted that he would definitely chain, that he would go to the Imperial Filion Academy and pass the test. His words were filled with resolve and determination. Hearing this, Ronan first smiled mischievously, then turned around to look at Asel. He commended him, telling him that for the first time, Asel was acting like a man. Seizing the momentum of this triumphant moment, he suggested that they immediately start preparing for the first trial for the upcoming more manly Asel. Asel, caught up in the excitement, struck a commando position and agreed with enthusiasm. He was ready to take on the challenges ahead, to become the person he wanted to be. But behind Asel's back, Ronan's smile turned into something more mysterious, even a little creepy. In his mind, he was already planning, recognizing that he had acquired a powerful ally for his future plans. Ossel's talent, once hidden and wasted, would now be harnessed for something greater. The scene shifts and the atmosphere becomes tense and thrilling. Ossel and Ronan are hidden in the dense bush, their eyes fixed on a campfire in the distance. The flickering flames cast eerie shadows on the surrounding, revealing a group of ripped goblins with razor-sharp teeth. They're sleeping beside the fire, evidence of their savagery scattered nearby in the form of chewed bones. The sight is both fascinating and terrifying. Nervously, Asel turns to Ronan and asks if this is his first trial. Ronan replies with a confident, Of course, explaining that this will be the perfect opportunity to hone Asel's skills. As he says this, his eyes shine with excitement, his mind already calculating the steps they need to take. With a polite smile, Ronan places his hands on Ossel's shoulders, trying to calm his trembling friend. He points out the goblins, commenting on how they look like completely small fries at a glance. But Asel's eyes are wide with fear, his body drenched in sweat. The challenge before him seems insurmountable, and the reality of what he's about to do is setting in. Suddenly, Ronan's face transforms into a scary and creepy expression, his eyes gleaming with an intense determination. He turns to Asel, his voice low and urgent, and says, Now then, why don't we get started? Next, Ronan began to explain, in a simple and clear manner, about the creatures they were observing. He told Asel that these were Luna Goblins, a type of mutation that appeared in this area. They could be easily identified by their yellow skin, which set them apart from ordinary goblins. But what truly defined the Luna Goblins wasn't their appearance, but their unusual habits. They're completely mad for gold and silver, Ronan said. They love to ambush unsuspecting merchants, snatch their treasures and take it back to their lair, he explained further. They then hold a grand feast, but only on nights with a full moon like tonight, listening to Ronan. Asel felt a shiver run down his spine. His eyes widened with fear and he gulped nervously. He then asked Ronan if that's why they were here, to which Ronan replied, his voice filled with excitement and anticipation, Yes, you're absolutely correct. With a deep and determined voice, he announced, Tonight, we're going to steal all that treasure from them. Asel had never heard of these types of goblins before, not even in the books he'd read in the library. He turned to Ronan with a puzzled expression, asking how he knew about these creatures. Ronan simply shrugged and replied he'd share the details when the time was right as he started opening his backpack. Suddenly, Ronan's arm snaked around Asel's shoulder in a casual side hug, causing Asel to blush. With a glint of greed in his eyes, Ronan explained the plan. While the goblins are sleeping, all you have to do is move the treasures from their chest into this bag. He made it sound simple, but Asel didn't think so. Fear gnawed at Asel's heart as he pondered over the possibility of making a mistake. What if he accidentally woke the goblins up? They could be in grave danger or worse, end up dead. His voice quivered as he expressed his concerns. This, this is a very dangerous plan. Can we rethink this? Ronan's face fell at Asel's words. It was clear that he was annoyed. Once again, Asel had slipped back into his old cowardly self. Ronan's eyes narrowed as he started to explain the real reasons behind their daring plan. To enter the prestigious academy, they needed two things. First, a substantial amount of money as the monthly fee was exorbitantly high, and second, practical experience in combat. Money was vital, but the experience was even more crucial. Asel listened, sitting on the ground, clutching his knees, a worried look in his eyes. Ronan's face was etched with determination as he continued. Filion is a place where nobles, who have received elite education since birth, gather, he said, his voice serious. The only way to compete against them is to pile on real practical experience with our lives on the line. Ronan's plan began to take shape in Asel's mind. By looting the treasures, they would solve their money problem. And if the goblins woke up, they would gain combat experience. 
It was a risky but perfect plan. Ronan looked at Aesil, asking once more if they needed to reconsider. But Aesil, although still scared and teary-eyed, knew they had no other choice. He nodded, agreeing to go along with the plan. With a firm slap on Aesil's back, Ronan encouraged him to get started, indicating his open backpack. Slowly but surely, Aesil began to transfer all the treasures one by one into the backpack. His face was strained with concentration, almost as if he was popping, but he successfully managed to transfer all the treasures without rousing the goblins from their sleep. Seeing this, Ronan patted Asil's head gently, his face breaking into a proud smile. I knew you'd be able to do it if you actually tried, he said, and even Aesil seemed surprised at his own accomplishment. Ronan watched Aesil's triumphant smile with warmth in his own heart. He had had his doubts about Aesil initially, but Asil proved to be much better than he had anticipated. Just then, an unsettling laughter erupted from Ronan. His eyes lit up in glee as he laughed, a wide, creepy smile spreading across his face. It was as though he had discovered something valuable. Once all the treasures were safely tucked into the bag, Ronan announced that their task was complete. Acel breathed a sigh of relief, thankful that the goblins had stayed asleep throughout the process. But Ronan quickly added that they should leave now before anything unfortunate happened. The scene then shifted abruptly to two men running wildly through the jungle. They were chasing a bird-like creature, shouting at each other to catch it. The sudden noise startled Ronan and Aesil, making them wonder who could be causing such a ruckus at this late hour. However, the noise wasn't just a concern for Ronan and Aesil. One of the goblins stirred from its sleep, turned around and noticed the empty treasure chest. It let out a high-pitched scream, jolting the rest of the goblins awake. When their eyes landed on Ronan and Aesil, the goblins didn't hesitate. They charged and attacking them. Caught in the sudden chaos, Aesil's face paled, his voice trembling as he screamed, Oh my god, we're dead for sure! Despair clouded Aesil's eyes as he sat on the ground. Ronan threw the bag of treasures beside him, remarking how he had been suspicious that everything had been going too smoothly. Aesil, his voice shaking with fear, proposed returning the treasures in hopes the goblins would spare them. Ronan shot down that idea immediately, asking how they would then pay their tuition fee. As the goblins rapidly closed the distance, panic set in for Aesil. What do we do now? He cried out. Ronan's gaze landed on his sword, pondering its durability. It was made of cheap steel, so he estimated it could withstand around 15 strikes. With roughly 30 goblins approaching, he had to be strategic. Three goblins lunged at them, their attacks swift and menacing. Aesil shut his eyes, expecting the worst. But the sound that followed wasn't what he expected. Opening his eyes, he witnessed a sight he'd never forget. With a single, fluid motion, Ronan had felled all three goblins, their heads separated from their bodies. The air was filled with shimmering droplets of blood that glittered like precious gems. Ossel stared, his mouth agape, unable to process what he'd just seen. Meanwhile, Ronan's sword dripped with goblin blood. His eyes, filled with a fierce determination, scanned the surroundings, ready for the next wave of attackers. After the dust settled, the scene was eerie. Crows with glowing red eyes circled overhead, preparing to descend upon the fallen goblins. Nearby, Aesil sat on the ground, his face a picture of disbelief. He had been certain that today would be his last. The entire battle seemed like a blur. First, with a swift motion, Ronan beheaded three goblins. Then, almost magically, he disappeared and reappeared, killing all the goblins in a flash. To Aesil, Ronan seemed like a hungry beast devouring his prey. With the threat eliminated, Ronan turned to Aesil and asked, Are you still going to keep acting scared? Aesil, overwhelmed by guilt and embarrassment, responded that he is sorry, as he couldn't help it as his body just froze. Ronan, resting his sword on his shoulder and giving Aesil a reassuring smile, replied, No need to apologize, I understand. Just remember... As long as I'm here, you're safe. Then we see Ronan complaining, saying he thought his journey would be peaceful for once, but his luck never seems to be on his side. Aesil, on the other hand, was groaning about the weight of the bag, his face clearly showing his stress. With a scowl, Ronan grasped his sore shoulder, reflecting bitterly on how weak he'd become. Just dealing with those small creatures wore him out, and he needs to start some serious physical training. Curious, Aesil asked about that loud noise that woke up the goblins. Ronan replied, how would he know? And whoever they were, they must have been out of their minds. Who screams like that in the middle of the night? Especially not two men, but their conversation was cut short. From the shadows, an arrow whizzed through the air, aimed directly at Aesil. 
Time seemed to slow as Ossel's eyes widened in terror. But before it could strike, Ronan's hand shot out, snatching the arrow from the air, inches from its intended target. Ossel stumbled back, startled by the near miss. Holding the arrow, Ronan glared into the darkness, trying to spot the attacker. Ossel, on the other hand, stared at the arrow, his imagination running wild. In his mind, the arrow transformed, taking on sinister eyes and a mocking grin, as if it was laughing at his fear. From the direction the arrow had come, two men emerged. One had a bow and arrow, while the other brandished a sword and carried a heavy bag on his shoulder. The duo mockingly commented that Ronan and Asel looked like mere children. Asel's eyes widened in panic, but an irritated Ronan quickly snapped the arrow in half. Realizing they had been caught off guard, the two men hastily apologized, blaming the darkness for mistaking them for monsters. Their gazes, however, couldn't escape the bags brimming with gold that Ronan and Asel had. With a feigned look of regret, they remarked how unfortunate it was to have almost killed humans by mistake, and extended their hands in a gesture of peace. But Ronan wasn't fooled. Ronan's eyes flashed with fury, resembling a ravenous beast ready to pounce. His voice seethed with anger as he demanded, Who are you people? The two men seemed taken aback by the intensity of his glare. The man with the bow slowly approached Ronan, one hand resting on his head and the other suspiciously behind his back. While trying to placate Ronan with apologies and introductions, he subtly pulled a dagger from behind him. With a shout, he yelled, We are Carabolo! and lunged at Ronan with the weapon aimed straight for his face. However, the name Carabolo seemed to resonate with Ronan. Reacting swiftly, Ronan grabbed the attacker's wrist, stopping the blade just in time. Without hesitation, he delivered a powerful punch to the man's face. Blood splattered from the man's mouth as he collapsed unconscious. Seeing his companion downed so easily, the swordsman charged at Ronan with a shout of raid. But before he could get close... Asel, coming out of his initial shock, quickly utilized his physic powers. The swordsman found himself suddenly frozen in place, unable to move. Seeing this, Ronan surprisingly praised Asel. Then he kicked the guy's hand, took the dagger from his hand, and in an instant, he chopped the dagger guy hundreds of times. After that, the dagger guy was confused as to what happened to him, as he didn't feel any pain or anything, but then he got chopped like a cabbage, and blood splashed like a fountain, scaring Asel. Nervous, Asel asked, Did Ronan really have to kill him? While Ronan wiped the blood from his face, he replied, Did Asel want him to spare them? He continued, They were Carabolo, so he had to kill those bastards, even if they didn't attack them. Confused, Asel asked, Who were they? Ronan explained that they were a group of people who did all kinds of dirty jobs to make money, kidnapping, illegal drug supply, and unimaginable things. While saying this, Ronan was stabbing the guy with the bow, killing him, and continued, If Ronan wasn't here, Asel would have died pathetically or even worse, sold as a slave, or his organs would have been robbed. Keeping these bastards alive, knowing who they are, is a crime, addressing Asel as brat. Suddenly, the bag Carabolo had been holding began to float, taking both Ronan and Asel by surprise. They quickly grabbed the bag and opened the lid. Two glowing blue eyes stared back at them. Without warning, a bluebird emerged, glowing as it hovered in midair. Asel was in awe of the bird, while Ronan raised an eyebrow. What is this? A chicken with a blue head? Noticing the unique blue feathers and a shackle on the bird's foot, Ronan grew more intrigued. Asel, with glittering eyes, admitted he'd never seen such a mysterious creature before, and neither had Ronan. On closer inspection, Ronan recognized the shackle was a magic item. It restricts mana, but why would someone put it on this bird? Before Ronan could finish his thoughts, a magic circle appeared behind the bird, and a voice began to speak. Asel, now frightened, tried to hug Ronan, exclaiming, How can a bird talk? Annoyed, Ronan pushed Asel back slightly, saying, Is Asel really an idiot? It was not the bird talking. Someone was using a communication magic spell through it. In sheer astonishment, the person seems like a beast man, saying he is Valen and currently conducting research on beast-taming magic. He is the guardian of that blue bird. For the past few days, he was unable to connect, but today he succeeded. Then he stopped and asked who the person he was talking to is. Ronan replied that they are just a pair of kind passers-by who somehow got into a fight with the poachers that kidnapped the bird. He was about to say he sliced them like cabbage, so he skipped the details as it was too bloody to explain. He just said shortly that he saved the bird. Hearing this, the beast man got panicked that his pet got kidnapped and thanked Ronan for saving her. 
He asked how he could repay them, but Ronan said to forget about the reward and how they could return the bird to him. He asked if the bird would go to him on its own if Ronan broke the shackles, and the beast man said yes, but it would be impossible. However, before he could finish his sentence, Ronan grabbed his sword and with a single slash destroyed the shackles, even surprising the chicken head. Ronan carefully sheathed his sword and motioned for the blue bird, which he mockingly referred to as chicken head, to return to its owner. But from the bird's viewpoint, Ronan was her knight in shining armor, having rescued her from danger. Unexpectedly, the bird turned around, showing her ass towards Ronan, who was now visibly irritated. Why is she showing me her ass? Ronan asked Valen, a hint of frustration in his voice. Valen chuckled softly, explaining that it's a sign of trust and gratitude in her species. She's saying she's comfortable around him and wants him to pluck one of her feathers. The feather can act as a compass pointing towards Valen, so Ronan can find the beast man quickly. Without further ado, Ronan carefully plucked a single feather while Aesil watched with interest, a mixture of fascination and uncertainty in his eyes. As the bluebird soared into the sky, a distant voice echoed, promising, he'll make sure to repay this kindness. But then Ossel spotted something odd about Ronan's hand. Hey, there's something weird on your hand, he said, pointing. Ronan glanced down, feeling a slight sting, and found himself at a loss for words upon seeing the unexpected object in his grasp. Three days later, they found themselves in the bustling heart of a city. Ronan was in the middle of a negotiation with a merchant, showing off his treasures. The merchant, a middle-aged man named Dune, held up a blue necklace, his eyes shining with excitement. He can offer 20 gold coins for this necklace, as it's of superior quality. After inspecting all of Ronan's items, Dune remarked, All of these treasures are top-notch. Ronan, a smirk on his face and hands crossed, responded, Finally, someone who knows their stuff. Every other merchant we have come across tried to rip us off. He was about to lose his temper at the thought of previous scammers, but Aesil somehow stopping Ronan, ensuring that things remained calm. Ronan and Dune's handshake was firm, both pleased with their interaction. Ronan felt grateful to have found an honest merchant, and Dune was honored that Ronan held him in such high regard. Aesil, watching the whole exchange from a few steps behind, let out a quiet sigh of relief. He was glad that, for once, Ronan wasn't on the verge of starting a fight. Curious, Ronan dug into his pocket and pulled out an odd-looking stone. Do you know what this is? He asked Dune. The merchant squinted at the stone, using his monocle to get a closer look. The object puzzled him. Meanwhile, Ronan's mind raced. He remembered acquiring the strange item from the blue bird they'd encountered earlier. It had appeared suddenly in his hand, shaped like an egg and emitting a strong odor. Initially, Ronan had assumed it was Chickenhead's poop due to its unpleasant smell. Annoyed, he had hurled it at a nearby boulder, expecting the object to break. Instead, the stone remained intact, and the boulder shattered to pieces. Both Ronan and Aesil had been taken aback by the unexpected outcome. Now, as Dune continued to study the stone, Ronan hoped it might be another rare treasure like the ones he had just traded. The merchant's gaze grew more intense, examining every inch of the mysterious object. Ronan held his breath in anticipation, thinking that Dune was about to reveal its great value. However, Dune's next words deflated all of Ronan's hopes. From its color and texture, Dune began, making Ronan's heart race. But then he concluded, it looks like horse dung. Ronan's face fell, and the excitement that had been building up fizzled out instantly. When Ronan's face fell into a look of disappointment, Dune hurriedly tried to rectify the situation, saying, he might have been hasty, he admitted. He's not entirely sure of what it is. It could be something valuable, so Ronan should have it appraised by an expert. Ronan, while still dubious, gave the egg-like stone one more scrutinizing look before placing it back into his pocket. He resolved to discover its true nature later, but Aesil, from the side, wondered if the item might just be an exceptionally tough piece of shit. Seeking to change the topic, Ronan inquired, Does Dune sell books about the Filion entrance exam? Dune's eyes lit up with excitement, asking, Is Ronan here for the exam? to which Ronan nodded and gestured towards Aesil, indicating that they both intended to participate. With a proud grin, Dune shared, his daughter was also applying for the exam too, and she might be able to assist both of them. Before Ronan could respond, a rowdy voice echoed from behind. Dad, what's happening here? Who are these people? It was Maria, Dune's daughter, with her long, beautiful golden hair, smooth white skin, and jade-like eyes. Dune introduced Marys with Ronan and Azel, saying they are special guests who just made a very big deal with them. However, Maria couldn't help but let a sarcastic remark slip from her lips. 
teasing Ronan and Aesel, suggesting they look like small babies who still look like they eat their mother's milk. Hearing this, Dune got angry, shouted at Maria, and apologized to Aesel for Maria's rude behavior. While Aesel tried to say it's okay, Ronan was thinking something else. Walking over to Aesel, Ronan stood in front of Maria and questioned her identity. Was she truly Maria, the one with Sen as her middle name? She replied that she is and asked how Ronan knew about it. Now Ronan, with a worried face, thought something was strange, as Maria definitely resembled a person he knew. But the person he knew was definitely not her. Then he stopped and signaled Maria to come closer as he wanted to ask an important question. Confused, Maria came closer to Ronan and whispered a very peculiar question into her ear. By any chance, do you have, you know, that thing down there? Uh, Dick? Maria's eyes went wide, a mixture of shock and disbelief evident in her gaze. Hearing Ronan's question, Maria was left in shock, wondering what did Ronan ask. Then she took a moment of pause to process it and started imagining herself with a dick. Meanwhile, Ronan, with his arms crossed, appeared a bit perplexed, commenting that no matter how he looked at Maria, it didn't seem like she had one. But before he could finish his sentence, a fist came flying towards him, and Maria slapped Ronan's face with great force, expressing her anger by calling him an up-bastard. As Ronan received the slap, he got into a flashback, thinking that this slap and the familiar sensation, and even her scent, are all the same as the person named Count Maria. But he was a man, not a girl. Then Ronan explained that when he was a normal soldier, Maria was in charge of supplies, and soon after they became good friends. But for some reason, whenever they talked about dicks or sexual thing, Maria for some reason always seemed to get angry. She used to slap Ronan just like now, and this slap felt too nostalgic. Ronan had always wanted to ask Maria why she got so angry when such topics came up, but their friendship had been cut short as Maria had died before Ronan and he was unable to save him. Now Ronan began to smile a little and felt a touch of emotion. Seeing the angry Maria, Ronan realized the reason Maria used to get angry was that she was a girl. Seeing Ronan smile, Maria prepared to deliver another punch, declaring that the last slap wasn't enough and that it seemed Ronan needed another one. However, before she could strike again, Ronan playfully flicked Maria's head, telling her to stop and annoyingly remarking that just because he had let Maria slap him, she was acting almighty. A small bump formed on Maria's head, and she too began to feel annoyed. Then in response, Maria headbutted Ronan on his chin, and they started fighting like two-year-old siblings, pulling each other's hair and shirts. Meanwhile, Don and Ashiel were left speechless, their mouths wide open, as they witnessed the entire scene unfolding before them. Don and Ashiel hurriedly ran toward Maria and Ronan, somehow managing to stop them from fighting. After a while, Ashiel found herself a bit confused. She had just witnessed Maria and Ronan fighting like wild animals, but now they were talking like friends. Maria handed Ronan a sword made of black iron and a magic wand to Ashiel, preparing them for an upcoming exam. Upon noticing Ashiel, Maria commented, Is this cutie the rare mage Ronan was talking about? Hearing this, Ashiel became a little shy, but confirmed that she was indeed the one Ronan had mentioned. Maria then asked Ashiel what type of magic she could use, and Ashiel, feeling somewhat embarrassed, hesitantly replied that she wasn't that great and could only use one type of magic, which was telekinesis. Hearing this, Maria was shocked and jumped from her chair, exclaiming in an astonished voice that telekinesis magic was ultra-rare. Even after decades of learning, most mages couldn't master it. She praised Ashiel as a true genius mage, leaving Ashiel feeling both amazed and shy as she hadn't realized the rarity of her magical ability. Then, Maria excitedly asked Ronan about the technique or mana skill he planned to perform in the practical exam. Ronan, a bit puzzled, asked, What technique? Maria explained that in the practical exams, he needed to showcase a technique or skill to impress the professors. She mentioned that there was a written exam as well, but even if someone failed the written exam but excelled in the practical exam, they could still enter the academy. That's why Maria inquired about Ronan's chosen technique to show the professors, emphasizing that besides sword technique, he would also need to demonstrate mana control. As soon as Ronan heard the word mana, he raised his hand and asked, do swordsmen also use mana even when they're not mages? Hearing this, Maria's eyes widened in disbelief. She explained that in Philion Academy, even a child could use mana, and for a swordsman, mana control was the basic and first step before performing any technique. Ronan listened with a confused expression. Realizing Ronan's lack of knowledge about mana, Maria pointed her hand at him in shock and asked, Don't tell me Ronan doesn't know how to control or even sense mana? In response, 
Ronan asked if mana was similar to using aura, leaving Maria momentarily stunned with her mouth wide open in amazement. Now, Maria appeared quite frustrated, holding her face with her hand. She exclaimed that she was talking to a guy who wanted to enter Philian Academy, and he didn't even know how to sense mana. Ronan's question about whether mana and aura were similar left her astonished. She emphasized that even a child could tell the difference, and here was Ronan, seemingly unaware. Ronan, with his usual casual attitude, replied that it wasn't a big deal, wondering why Maria was making such a fuss. Maria had had enough of Ronan's lack of knowledge. With a serious tone, she took her sword and told Ronan to come out into the jungle. She wanted to show him something and give him some special juicy training. Maria began to explain to Ronan that mana was everywhere around the earth, and one had to absorb mana from the environment and store it inside their body. This process was called mana sensing or mana control. Normally, it took years of training just to sense a little bit of mana. At Philion Academy, everyone had already mastered mana control and had even mastered their special sword technique. Then there was Ronan, who didn't even know the difference between mana and aura. Ronan, wanting to learn more, asked what aura was. Maria explained that aura was a type of mana, or you could say it was the advanced form of mana. She clarified that a person would have to master mana, engage in battles for decades, and achieve enlightenment before they could use aura. Ronan recalled that he had indeed met guys on the battlefield who would use aura in battle. They used to brag about being aura users and their special techniques to Ronan. However, they all ended up dying, leaving Ronan all alone. Now Ronan had a chance to learn that very aura and potentially save all his friends and family, whom he had lost in his previous life. Maria, with a loud voice, declared that enough chatting had taken place and Ronan would learn faster from some juicy practical practice. With that, Maria dashed toward Ronan with her weapon, and Ronan quickly raised his sword to block her attack. As Ronan exchanged some blows with Maria, Ronan said, despite being so young, she has so much power for her young age, but it was not enough to defeat Ronan then, even though she attacked Ronan with all her might. She couldn't land a single hit on him, and Ronan just effortlessly blocked all her attacks. Then Maria activated her mana, and started a barrage of attacks toward Ronan, but Ronan effortlessly blocked them all. Now Maria was in deep thinking. She wanted to show Ronan how powerful those who use mana are compared to those who can't use them, because she thought it would be better to get a reality check here than face humiliation in the test area, but why was she the one getting pushed back? As Ronan, with a deadly look of a war dragon, glared at Maria, she started to think how Ronan was doing this when he can't even use mana. It seemed impossible. But then Ronan cut her thoughts, saying, What is Maria thinking? Between this serious duel and with a single swing, he pushed Maria back. Then Ronan, with a deadly look, raised his sword high and in a flash, launched his attack toward Maria's head, shouting that Maria should dodge this attack instead of blocking. Then, as Ronan launched his fierce slash, Maria just barely dodged the heavy attack. In shock, just the force of Ronan's sword was enough to push Maria backward, and Maria barely stood on her leg using her sword. Then, with a respected face, Maria said something bad would have happened if she didn't dodge that attack and asked Ronan, You are not a normal man, are you? Ronan, with a smiling face, replied that Maria herself is not normal. But then, Ronan started teaching Maria, saying Maria is indeed really skilled with her sword, and she is just lacking real battle experience. With that, Ronan started to go, and Maria asked him from behind where he is going. Then Maria started to shout like a child, saying not to think that Ronan is thinking the duel is over and Ronan won. But before she could finish her sentence, Maria's sword cracked a bit, and then bam, her sword shattered into small pieces, leaving Maria bewildered. Ronan, with a serious face, said to Maria that now the duel is over, and he is sure Maria learned something from the special training. Now Maria was just confused, thinking she was the one who was going to teach Ronan, but how things turned out like this. Then from behind, Ashil, with a bright warm smile, started praising Maria, saying good job as he who felt that Maria got a little embarrassed. Ashil then mentioned that he was going to sleep as he was tired and ran toward Ronan, leaving Maria in a state of shock. As she watched Ronan and Ashil heading to their tent, Maria was left wondering who they really were. The next morning, Maria bought all the necessary items needed for the exam, including weapons, armor, books, food, and everything else. Ashil was very happy to see this, but Ronan appeared annoyed. He questioned whether he really had to study all those books, and Maria jokingly replied in the affirmative. She then playfully praised herself, mentioning that she had learned all this material in just two weeks. Maria added that Ronan had a whole month, 
so he should be able to do it if he wasn't dumb when it came to studying. Ronan's frustration grew, and he drew his sword, but Maria reassured him that she was just joking. With a bright smile, Maria lightly tapped Ronan's chest and encouraged him to study hard. She expressed her excitement about studying together with Ronan, as if she felt a deep connection with him. She emphasized that both Ronan and Ashil had to pass the exam, even waving goodbye from a cow cart as she left the village. Ashil waved back in response, but Ronan remained standing there with a serious expression. Ronan, gazing at his hand, realized that he had to train his currently weak body during this month. Additionally, he had to delve into studying, a task he had never seriously tackled in his previous life. Despite the challenges, Ronan was filled with determination and excitement for the journey ahead. After returning home, Ronan's days fell into a routine, but they were somehow different from his previous life. Unlike before, he now shared his meals with Nana, relishing every bite he had missed in his previous life. Ronan, with the calories he consumed from these hearty meals, devoted himself to hunting monsters around the village. This method not only increased his stamina, but also adapted his body to the point that all the monsters in the vicinity became extinct due to his relentless hunting. In addition to his hunting, Ronan spent time studying, a pursuit he hadn't considered during his soldier days. He wasn't sure yet if it would all be worth it, but he was determined to give it his best shot. A month flew by and the stage of the story was finally set. This magnificent place was known as the Imperial Capital Wallen, and right in its center stood the Empire's premier educational institution. Assel stood before the colossal building, unable to believe his eyes. It felt surreal, as if he were in a dream. Today marked the day they would enter this place, the Philian Academy. Assel was in awe of the sight before him, confirming that the city itself was a work of art. Interrupting his reverie, someone called him out. It was a familiar face, Ronan. Assel was glad to see him again, but couldn't help but notice that Ronan had changed in just a month, growing significantly stronger. Ronan, impatient with the distractions, urged Assel to keep moving. Assel inquired if Ronan had brought something specific, the feather plucked from the bird they had saved that night. It was meant to help them find the bird's owner. Ronan produced the feather and suggested they first meet the owner before heading to the examination area. To their surprise, the feather pointed upward, indicating that the person they were supposed to meet resided at the top of the building. Meanwhile, on the top floor of the building, a professor was grumbling about his work while holding the bird that Rowan and Assel had rescued that night. The bird began chirping, seemingly aware that its savior had reached the capital. Its owner was a lion-headed beastman professor at the academy named Varen. Then the professor thought to open the windows to let in some fresh air, and as the beastman professor opened the window, he was greeted by Ronan, who had a rather unsettling smile on his face, and exuded a dark and chilling aura. Ronan didn't even bother to knock, and the window seemed to open automatically, shocking the professor to his core. He began to scream in terror. Ronan immediately noticed the blue bird in the room and realized that this beastman was the owner of the bird. The lion-headed professor trembled in fear, not expecting anyone to enter his room through the window. He demanded that Ronan reveal his identity. Just then, Asel also entered through the window, and Ronan complained that the professor's scream had been so loud it felt like he was going deaf. Asel, somewhat embarrassed, explained that this was why he had suggested using the door. The lion-headed professor, still shaken, asked if the strangers were after his blue bird. However, upon closer inspection, he noticed the feather that Ronan was holding and suddenly became excited, realizing the identity of his unexpected visitors. These two were the heroes who had saved his pet from poachers that night. The professor began apologizing profusely for his earlier behavior. Ronan told him to stop and forget what had happened. Ronan then apologized on behalf of both of them and jokingly shifted the blame to Asal, saying it was his idea. Asal tried to defend himself, but Ronan covered his mouth and told him to stay quiet. Ronan expressed his surprise that the lion-headed professor was a professor at the academy. In return, the professor mentioned that he hadn't expected the heroes to be applicants to the academy, and said that if he had known, he would have written them recommendation letters to ease their admission process. However, Ronan seemed less interested in these pleasantries and had come with a specific question for the lion-headed professor. Ronan brought the purple thing that he pooped out last time. This statement confused Varen, but as he got a closer look at the said poop, he figured that this thing right here was a dream bird egg. Ven started to feel amazed as he held the egg. Roman thought that this was just a normal egg from the bird. The professor then explained that this egg right here was not an ordinary egg. This is a dream egg. 
The most interesting thing about this one was that no one has an idea of what's going to hatch from this egg. He further explained that if this was just an ordinary egg, it was natural that a bird would be hatched from it. But in this case, it was different. A dream egg would depend on the environment surrounding it, as it would absorb unique mana for it to be hatched. Legends say that in an area of lava, a phoenix wrapped in flames would hatch from the egg. And if it has absorbed mana in a monster's nest, a new form of monster would come out. There were also some circumstances where it wouldn't take the form of a bird at all. Varen then added that he could still predict what creature would be coming out from the egg by observing the mana from it, but he emphasized that this one was kind of unique. The types of mana that were inside this one were countless and in great numbers. It even had these rainbow colors in it. As for the moment, Varen wouldn't be able to know what creature will be hatched in it. Ronan became confused from the amount of information he got from the professor. Then the lion-headed professor recommended that Ronan keep the egg close to him, and then he handed Ronan something, indicating that it would help with hatching the egg. Ronan accepted the item with curiosity. Next, we see all the students gathered in a large hall, awaiting their turn for the practical exam. Ronan, however, was sitting there casually, feeling a bit bored. To his side, Maria was dressed in a tight-fitting outfit showing her big melons. Ronan couldn't help but notice her big melons and asked her about it, wondering if it was comfortable. Maria proudly explained that it was the Academy's official dress designed by the principal, and she was so confident in her acceptance that she wore it in advance. She playfully placed her hand on Ronan's shoulder and mentioned that if he got accepted, he'd have to wear a similar tight dress, which annoyed Ronan. They chatted for a while, and finally, Ronan's number was called. As he stood up, ready to go, Maria jokingly told him not to be nervous and to follow her teachings. She added that if Ronan failed the exam, she wouldn't let him live it down. Ronan waved his hand, thanking her for the ass-touching support. With a confident smile, he declared that he will be back in no time. As Ronan entered the hall, he was greeted by five professors, but two of them particularly caught his attention. One was this old man, the pervy principal who made that dress that Maria wore, and the other was this hot damn woman, a sword master professor. Ronan bowed to introduce himself, and the professors explained the task at hand. In front of him was a dummy, and Ronan's objective was simple, to attack the dummy with his special sword technique or any mana-infused attack with all his might. The professor asked what technique Ronan was going to perform today, and Ronan, unsheathing his sword, said, Nothing fancy, just a casual slash. He thought this slash would be enough for the dummy. Hearing this, all the professors got shocked. The yellow long-haired professor started to criticize Ronan, saying that the dummy was enhanced with defensive magic and could even withstand an attack from an aura master. Then they started making jokes again, calling Ronan a city bumpkin who would always remain a city bumpkin. The principal was getting a little annoyed, thinking that the professors were making fun of the student in front of them, and he planned to punish them later. However, the principal noticed something as Ronan prepared his sword. The headmaster saw hidden potential in Ronan, and his eyes widened, wondering how a kid could have such strong bloodthirst and mighty force. Then, in an instant, Ronan gave a quick, precise slash to the dummy's neck. Seeing the slash, the hot damn teacher's eyes widened, and Ronan casually declared that he was done. The long-haired and white-haired professors continued to mock Ryu, claiming that he wouldn't even scratch the dummy. However, when they turned to the principal to inquire about his opinion, they were met with his speechless expression, wide open eyes, and a surprised grin on his face. The attractive swordmaster professor, with a fierce and wild look, slammed her hand on the desk and startled everyone. In one swift motion, she charged toward Ronan, placing her sword at his neck, and with a fierce look, like a wild beast, she asked Ronan, Are you a virgin? She asked from where he had learned that sword technique. And with that, the episode ends here. Write part two in the comment and give a green heart in the comment if you watch till here. Thank you.